It's been a while, guys, but we're back. Uh, I wouldn't really call it face first. I wouldn't really call it precision talk. Maybe we'll give it a name after today, but I am honored. Uh, for me, this is huge. This is the place, shoot, that at least made old RC. I don't know about young RC. Our, young RC was made in Louisiana, but this is Ian Danny. I call him the fitness guru because at some point he got a magazine that was shipped to him and the magazine actually said fitness guru. Not too many people can have that. He's the owner, the president, the CEO, any other name that you can put in to say somebody runs this joint of performance enhancement professionals. And so Ian, it's, it's hot as hell here, first mm -hmm. off, yeah. right? And I remember I used to be able to come here, play Danny Ball. By the way, y'all, he has a game that he made up and the name of it is his last name, Danny Ball. That's when you're doing big things. And other people play it and actually call it that. But when you get into the dog days of summer here in Arizona, what is it that you are pushing your players to understand? Because I was out here, man. It was the heat. Your motivation is a little different because you're from Canada. It doesn't necessarily come across uh, as it does in the boot. But when you have those guys, man, and you're trying to get them to do that extra rep, you're trying to get them to make that, to take that extra sprint, what is your focus as you're talking to them? You know, it's different for every guy. Uh, I think that's a big thing. You just have to understand what motivates what guys and what they're willing to work hard on. And some guys just are more willing to work hard on some things than others. So putting them in the right situation so they can work hard. And then just really encouraging them that, hey, it's crunch time. We're here. You know, this is the last opportunities we have to take advantage of it. So just dig in, get everything out of the tank. You know, it's you can be uncomfortable now. You can be uncomfortable later. And it's going to be a whole lot more uncomfortable later. So let's just get uncomfortable now. Yeah, and you made me uncomfortable a lot, actually. I just thought I'd put that out there. But, you know, I mentioned, um, you know, that, that you're from Canada. And obviously, sports are, are different, not necessarily different, but they're a priority put on other sports. And, and you were an athlete who was involved in Olympic sports, whether it be uh, bobs, sledding, uh, lifting, sprinting. Tell us a little bit about your athletic background, because I think sometimes things get missed and guys are like, oh, he's just a trainer. But a lot of the, the great trainers, as you are, to me, the, the best that's in the business, has a background in athletics. What is yours? Well, I was a track and field athlete, and I moved out from track and field onto bobsled. I was an Olympic bobsledder, and uh, then I got into coaching track and field, and um you know, I just was fortunate to have good people along the way and had some good mentors, met the right people, and uh, just kind of worked. And you know, as an athlete, I was always the guy that was you know, not always the most talented guy, but willing to try and outwork everybody. And I just try to do the same thing when I transferred it, when I, you know, shifted over into training. Just try to keep that same mindset, just keep working, keep learning, keep moving forward and seeing what I could do. Okay, so let's, I want to dive into that uh, a little bit. Um, there is, you know, you was like Carl Lewis time, you know what I'm saying? And, and, and Ben was running uh, in Canada around that time as well. What was, what, what was it like competing and, and sprinting against some of those legends? And just what was the atmosphere of the track and field world then? Uh, well, it was... Uh... There was a big, but those two guys right there, there was a big rivalry, you know, right. being Canadian and it was kind of uh, a lot of, we didn't love the whole American bravado and the whole, <laughs> whole, you know, Carl Lewis mega ego type stuff. So there was that battle going on, but it was, uh, there was still a lot of camaraderie. It was a lot of fun. A lot of stuff was happening. Um, you know, we didn't have social media and the internet and all type of stuff. So I'm dating myself like crazy, but um, so there was a lot more. Uh, there was a lot less outside noise and a lot more just sort of interaction with what was happening in real time. More people were present, I think, but it was fun. You know, it's so crazy. You know, people like me who aren't fast, we watch track and field and Marvel. You know, and like when I started wa watching, it was the Ben Johnsons, the Carl Lewis's, uh, the Flo Joes, people like that. And then, you know, you move on. And now I think Noah Lyles just ran 19 three in the 200 and you know we've watched we've watched sports progressed so now as a trainer as the 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 trends change change as the science becomes different also as the athletes change the social media age and now we're seeing the cute drills and the pretty things 
do you or have you adjusted the way that you train guys? And if you have, then how? Uh, I have not so much adjusted the way that I train guys. And to be quite frank, it's probably kind of makes me a bit of a dinosaur in terms of keeping up with kind of what's out there in terms of the advertising marketing aspect of it. But that, that's of zero concern to me. I'm, I'm just, I'm focused in on one guy at a time, doing the correct training for him, assessing him right, not being bound to a system, but just carefully uh, planning what that individual person needs and focusing on training them all in a one-on-one -on -one environment so they get exactly what they need. And that has been the same for me from day one. That aspect of it hasn't changed. Of course, you learn, you add new things, you expand the toolbox, you make mistakes, you fix your mistakes, you keep, all those things are happening. But in terms of the approach to it, I don't think the approach has really changed much for me. Mm. Yeah. And so, in, in, in that, you know, you're talking about the approach not changing, you focusing on, on one guy at a time, you know, social media not being the thing. You've trained probably, at least as far as my knowledge goes, as far as social media goes, the, the one football player that social media loves to watch train, and that's James Harrison. You know, and, and, and when you're training a guy like James Harrison who, who when he played was obviously nuts, you know, about his, his work ethic and the way he ate and the way he trained. Bro, I saw him a couple of weeks ago. He's even bigger now. So when you, when you have a guy that loves it like that, what type of enjoyment does it bring? But also challenges, challenges in this dude's been training with you for over a decade. Yeah, well, long over a decade, yeah. Um, well, it is fun. So on the enjoyment side of it, it's great. Um, but at the end of the day, when a guy like that, my job is more putting on brakes than anything else. Like, if I let him do all that he wants to do, he'll blow up. So I have to kind of like dial him back, make sure I don't give him too much. If I tell him that I wanted him to do four or something, I got to tell him I only want him to do two or three so that we actually end up where we're at. Right. You know, that's a whole different mindset of dealing with that type of person. Um, and sometimes you get the absolute opposite of that, where that someone needs to be constantly motivated and that sort of underwork or whatever. But um, with him, it's really a matter of managing workload, balancing things, and um, making sure we put a big emphasis on recovery because he will push himself more than he probably should push himself. Right, you mentioned like you, get, you can get the James Harrisons or the opposites. When you do get the opposites, what type of challenges are presented in that? Because no matter how hard that guy works, people are gonna look at you. Right, they're gonna be like, oh, this Ann Danny guy, people told me to go train there, and it may be the dudes missing two of the six workouts a week. Mm -hmm. uh, when you have those type of guys, is that something you take as a, a personal challenge? And how do you try to work around changing his mindset or at least getting him to understand how important it is that you follow the program that's put in place? Yeah, well, I think part of it is, is, is relationship, right? It's like anything in life, it's hard to sort of speak into someone's life about something they want to do unless you have a relationship with them. So as you build more and more relationship with them, more trust, more buy-in, it gets easier and easier to talk to them about those types of things. And you have to start, you kind of have to take a gradual approach and get in there with that and, and do it as you build the relationship. Otherwise, it's going to fall on deaf ears is what my experience is. That's number one. And number two, you also have to be careful of how much you really want to push them because what I've, what I've learned over many years is that sometimes the guys that are the most freaky talented can't do the work that you think you want them to do. And you think, okay, if they can do more, imagine what they could be. But at the end of the day, that's really not the case. Like a good example I could give you is... Um, a Ferrari is a great car. Mm -hmm. It does a lot of stuff. It's unbelievable. Everyone would like to have a Ferrari. But at the end of the day, a Ferrari is always going to be in the shop. And if, right. you, if you treat a Ferrari like a pickup truck, it's going to be a problem. Right. So you got you to gotta also be able to understand, like, what type of guy am I dealing with? And sometimes what you think, or I would think a lot, just because of my own background and, and, and how I had to work to get things done, that this guy is just underworking. But he might actually be doing exactly what he needs to be doing for his Ferrari, and you gotta be careful with that too. Yeah, and so, speaking of like different guys, like I remember, man, being here with uh, the Walt Harris's, uh, Brandon Lloyd's, like you've trained a ton of guys who, at least to me, were different personalities, and I've watched you navigate all of those personalities. What are some of the, who are some of the dudes that, that have trained here that not necessarily may have become 
the the best players, right? What weren't the best players? Because sometimes that's just talent. Mm -hmm. But who are some of the dudes, man, that you are most proud of? It's like, okay, I remember what this cat was when he started here and the work that we were able to do. And not only the the way that we gained in what it is that your business is and making them bigger, faster, stronger, more durable, but you actually got to see that uh, display itself in their sport or their field of play. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean... We're on your podcast, but you'd be one of those guys. You know what I mean, so <laughs> I mean, you had to say that definitely for sure. You know, yeah. Making you know, just sort of taking a lot of uh, a lot of hard work and a lot of effort, a lot of planning, a lot of smarts and, str and strategic stuff, yeah. and, and, and maximizing your talent for sure. I'd say you know you'd you'd be up there like that. Um, you know, in some sense, you know, James would be one of those guys too because he's. I mean, people think he's uber talented but at the end, of the end of the day he's more he's more work than anything like that yeah. um those are probably some of the biggest i mean you mentioned walt earlier he's another one of those guys talented but not super talented you know london fletcher another guy like that you know you know all work and not so big on the talent <laughs> side but still talented right i got you you know so i, I think there's there's a number of them and most of the guys that are you know the undrafted free agents or mm -hmm. and it's not always the case but you know but the guys who kind of come in knowing that they've got to work and then and that's and, and they're set up to do that mm -hmm. they can make the gains and um for me that's really rewarding because it's because then you you really see okay this guy started here and it's uh, it's black and white it's like I don't even know if he's really gonna make it or not and then all of a sudden he goes on to have a big career and does a lot of things and you know and you learn from that and you build on it and then other people see it too right. you know so I think what's interesting to me now is in this age it's sort of a social media driven well, I've got this many followers and I tr you know this guy here likes me he's endorsing me he's this and that's kind of how they grow but really for me in my business over the years. I've gotten more uh, business from guys who were lower end, not so talented guys that went on and made it for a long time. Because I think a lot of athletes, they look and they'll say, okay, yeah, this, this guy was a top five pick. Yeah, so what? You trained him, he did whatever. It's not a big deal. But when you get the guys who are like, man, I remember that dude when he was 180 pounds and he was undrafted free agent. Now I see him here. Those kind of guys actually make better, or at least they have for me, made way better testimonies to grow my business than like the top five picks. So that, that's, that's been interesting. Yeah, it's so funny. I remember, I remember getting the call from Sean Springs' assistant. <laughs> um, I, I was, it was my first year in Pittsburgh. I played well, but I got injured. I was gonna be in this whole position battle. I got hurt, you know, like I said, toward the end of the year. And, you know, she was just like, look, I have the guy for you. And I just, I still remember the, the first conversation and, you know, you kind of laying out the plan. Here's how, how it will work. And the first day I get here, man, you, you take my body fat. I was like skinny fat at the time. I had been eating gumbo for the last, you know, eight weeks. And, you know, when you laid the plan out, it did to me at that time, it was, it seemed drastic. You know, when you're like, okay, this is what you're going to eat. And these are the times you're gonna eat. And this is the level of protein. These are the, this is the caloric value. We're gonna work out six days a week. I was like, sure, I gotta be here on Saturday morning too. You know, and it, and it was all of these things. And it was, okay, you're gonna do it this way. And then I remember getting around, it was right before OTAs. And you know, you kind of took a picture, took my body fat again. But I remember walking into the building and people right away, just from looking at me, being able to see the visual difference. The, the, the visibility of the changes uh, that were already made. And I think for, for players, for players, you kind of sometimes need that instant gratification. Like it wasn't like I got on the grass and did anything. It was just people saying, I see the work you're putting in, it's noted. And so when, when you are putting plans together for each of these guys individually, is, is the focus more so, or how do you focus in and hone in on what that particular player needs to be great while consist being consistent to what you think each player needs as a foundation to continue to grow as an athlete? Yeah, that's a good question. And a, a big part of the answer is like, where are they in the process and where are they in the journey and how much of a foundation do they already have? How much of it has to get established? And then I keep coming back to it again, I'm not married to any one system. I'm, I look at it and I say, what does this person need? What, what's gonna be the best way to get him there? What is he gonna respond to best? And, and most importantly for me, I think every day the person comes in, it's a new assessment. 
you kind of you see them, you evaluate them, you talk to them, you sell your feeling, you're, you're making adjustments on the fly, you're changing everything from the warm up to whatever might happen, and so you're you're constantly taking that feedback and dialing it in over and over again, and that that to me is is the secret sauce, if you will. That that that's what takes things to the next level, and I think that's what's really that component's really missing because now we're we're sort of in a world where. You've got to make things very scalable because mm-hmm. people want to make it scalable, bigger, make turn it into an app, do whatever they right. whatever they need to do with it, and that's great. And like you know, from a business perspective, it's fantastic. But really, to get the most out of what you want to get from an athlete and take that athlete to a super high level, it's it's what you want to do is the opposite. You want to be constantly dialing, constantly rechecking, making those changes, and and giving that athlete what they need in real time. You have grown this business. I remember when we started, and like I, I'm sure I wasn't around for like the inception, right? I remember in, in starting the business, man, the, the way you were able to convince me I was in the right place because I had been to places that were bigger. We were in that office building mm-hmm. at the time and, and we would pull sleds inside. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like I remember laying on uh, linoleum you know what I'm saying, after, after pulling the sled uh, in the building. But I was so convinced and so dialed in that if I do this, it, it makes me the, the best player I can possibly be. When you started in the business, did you have a dream of performance enhancement professionals? I don't even know if you knew it was going to be that then becoming what it is to where you have uh, players in all different sports. You have, you know, all pros and all stars and, you know, future Hall of Famers um, in, in different sports. And, and now people seek you out, not because you have the great social media, but because of the word of mouth of those same players saying, listen, I have the guy for you if you're willing to put it, put in the work. Did you did you think about that when you started in this business? Absolutely not. I, I, I wish, if I could go back in time, I wish I would have planned that better and done that and had a bigger vision for that. But I was literally just, I love what I'm doing. I love trying to find new ways to make more gains for more people. And I'm just going to work with what I have now. And I, was, I did not give it a thought to growing a big business or doing this or doing that. I, like I said, if I could go back in time, I could, I'd probably be a whole lot farther ahead if I thought that way. But I was <laughs> right. just... I'm just working and loving it. Right. Do you think, do you, do you ever look back at those times and, and wish you had done it differently? Or do you feel like your process and your journey is what got you to this point? I think I, my process and my journey is what got me to this point. Like just being so obsessed about just wanting to learn and get better at my craft and having absolutely zero desire or interest in sort of marketing or telling anybody about it and doing those types of things. Um, at the time was served me very well and it helped me develop as a coach and a trainer and, and as a communicator with my athletes um, in a way that I would just never be able to get again. And just having other people, just being able to bring some other coaches along and, 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 and teach them that and then learn from other people that wanted to, to mentor me and do different things like that. All those things, I wouldn't change any of that at all. And I think that's, in some ways, uh, that's a little bit of what's missing now, you know? Um, It used to be that people were okay with doing the equivalent of a 10-year internship to get really good at what they were at, and now they want a 10-minute TED Talk to get there. (laughs) Right, right. And it's just... Microwave world. Yeah, there you go. And it's just, it doesn't happen. So that part of it, I have zero regrets for. I'm glad I did. I'll do it all over again. But um, I should have probably been a bit more strategic and smarter in terms of, like, building it out as a business as opposed to, like, a job, you know? I think I think we always you, you run into those you run into those different uh, I guess obstacles or you run into some adversity when you do try to marry the two, right? If, if as a player who who trained with you, that process is what helped me get to year thirteen, right? The fact that you did focus on that process and I wasn't I wasn't just business to you, right? That that it was a passion. Like I could tell the mornings we were. Uh, still doing treatment at 2 a.m. trying to fend the Sons of Anarchy, you know what I'm saying? Like that, to me, to me, like that wasn't business, you know, and that's, and that's, you know, not among other things, why we're still such close friends that you actually care about the athletes that you train. And in speaking of, 
of even what it is now with you not necessarily being focused on it becoming this big business, who are some of the athletes that you think really help you sh start to grow into, you know, because football has become the thing now. Like the way you train football has truly become a staple and a mainstay of performance enhancement professionals. You know, I mentioned Sean Springs and, you know, how that was how I learned about you and got an opportunity to work with you. Who do you think are some of those other guys that really helped you start this business and grow it? So you're talking really early on? Yeah, like really early on. Really yeah. On. yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, you mentioned Springs. That's too, that's, that's true there. And I think, um, Obviously, there was a period of time there were guys like Thomas Jones, mm -hmm. you know, uh, even crazy David Boston, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, er early on for sure. Um, you know, um, those are probably some of the biggest guys early right, on. Right, start, right. Yeah. And, like, I think when you, when you go back to or when you look at, at, that, at those times, right, when you, when you were in, in those times, did you recognize what it was to have those guys here or to be training those guys. So what Sean was what, second, third pick of the draft? Right? Yeah. Da David Boston was it was an extremely, you know, high draft pick as well. When when you were training those guys, did did you kind of recognize like, oh shoot, like like this is my chance. Like I do I do well with these guys and then that continues to promote business and bring different guys into the fold for me. Uh you know what? I, I wasn't really focused on that at the time. Um what I was really focused on was like how I could help them, like how I could bring value to them. And then I figured if I put myself in a position to value, things would just bleed and, and, and the ball would just roll. So that, that's really kind of what I was focused on. And then also, I felt like the way the whole uh, group of trainers and people at the time were working, it was, like, it was almost like I, was, I had this cheat code because people weren't doing what I was doing at the time. So the whole concept of things like track side and weight room side therapy, where like we actually had a table on the field and in the weight room doing work on guys as they're working out and doing all those types of stuff. You know, in like 2001, that, very few people were doing that, mm -hmm. you know? And, um, and I was just surprised. I was like, to me, this just, this, is, this makes sense. Like you need to integrate this, you need to make this work and, and just dialing guys in better, you know, in terms of nutrition and what they're doing and just being a lot more scientific in their approach to training and so uh, there just weren't that many people doing it so i felt like this is if i just introduced them what i thought were pretty simple and basic straightforward concepts these guys would do well and then it would carry on to others but i didn't think it out that far ahead like oh this could be like the jump off type of thing that, yeah. see that was yeah. the problem man you should have been thinking this could be the jump off yeah i mean we yeah. have yeah. dang pp shirts all around what you need to do yeah. is what you need to do is still have my before and after picture yeah. of year one and <laughs> blow them up <laughs> Right, because now I'm actually slightly popular, bro. And so, like, if you put those out, you'd be like, "Man, I could turn you into Mushy from Mushy Podcast Ryan to Ryan that hit Willis McGahey." You know what I mean? Like, you could just put that on top of the pictures, and it'll be. You have, um, you have a son. You know, you have a son now. Yeah. Uh, and when you think about the way that you and your wife are are raising him. Do you ever want him, not to get into the business, but do you ever want him to love training, to love working, those type of things? Or are you like, man, Eli, man, just do whatever you want, man. I'm much closer to the do whatever you want. I mean, the thing is, is what I love about athletics in general is that if you set it up right and you work and you grind, it allows you to put yourself in positions of extreme discomfort, which are relatively safe, and learn how to grind and work and get through all those things. And I think no matter what you end up doing, you can direct all those things that you're learning and all that energy and all that overcoming power to whatever else you end up doing. Mm -hmm. And so from that sense, I would love to have him involved in athletics just to learn that more than anything. But he, at this point, he doesn't really have a bent towards that, so I'm not sure that he's ever gonna do that. So. I know for me, I just think that uh, what I try to tell him, and it's kind of hard to explain it to him at 11, but it's just I just want him to, to work hard at being the best that, you, that he can be in, in many different ways. And I feel like you're, someone's always going to be stronger than you, someone's always going to be faster than you, someone's always going to be smarter than you. Those are always going to go. And I, I basically just try to tell him, like, I want you to try and be the kindest person you can be. Because A, 
that benefits so many people when they, when you can do that. And B, there's no competition. Nobody, nobody <laughs> right. else is trying to do that, so right. it's not hard to be the best person you can be. And I just kind of encourage him to do that over and over mm -hmm. and try to find ways that he can learn to work and then challenge that work or, or channel that work into something else. When you look at, you know, your career, your journey from, from athlete to, to trainer to now, you know, I keep saying it to who I think is the best in the business. What was the most uh, important decision you had to make? Like, what, what, what do you think was the one decision when it came to this business or the, the one distinction between you and everybody else where you were like, you know what, this is who and Danny is going to be the trainer. This is the next step that I'm taking that you feel really help you pull this thing, you know, together, I guess, in its totality. Mm -hmm. Well, in terms of like what really distinguishes me, I'm not sure that there's one easy answer to that. But in terms of what is the singular biggest decision I made that I think helped me out, that's easy. When I made the decision to just burn the ships, it was like, no, I wasn't, there was one plan and that was it. Plan A was going to be plan A. There was no way I was going to fail. It didn't matter. I put all my eggs in it mentally, emotionally, financially, everything, and just went with it. That making that decision to do that. When was, was the this? Best I ever made. Probably around, uh, you know, 1999. Really? When I decided that was it. There was nothing else was going to happen. But that's awesome. And so, like, the one thing I want to do in, in the way that, you know, we're starting to move forward is I want to be able to educate. I want to be able to teach. If there's, now, I, and I say this and I make a joke about it, you know, I do a ton of defensive back training and I call it the new drug dealer, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm like, shoot, cats don't want to really go out and get a real job. Like, this is the talent they have. They're like, mm -hmm. I'm going to go teach people how to be a DB. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go teach somebody how to be a wide receiver and do certain things. Uh, you've you've approached this in uh, one from an educational standpoint, continuing uh, to grow your knowledge, continuing to uh, have the experiences that keep you at the forefront of everything medically. But for somebody who's just getting into this business, if they want to be the next in Danny, if they want to be able to train a guy and have treatment track side, have treatment weight room side, what do you think are some of the foundational principles that have helped you get to where you are? Uh, I think a couple of them are just, just constantly learning and, and admitting when you're wrong and admitting when you're wrong pretty quickly because the, you're going to make some mistakes in the beginning and having trying to get around people that have been there that have made some mistakes and you know from an actual training perspective understanding how to do that and um, you know when you, you when you sit down and you make a plan and actually this is one thing that one of my mentors Dan Paff told me like in the 90s like you make a plan to get a guy from here to there and in his case that would be say the Olympic Games or something right and you lay that out he told me in all his years he's never taken an athlete from here to there on plan A well wow. it's never happened in other words shit's going to happen stuff's going to change and it's important to be planned but what i learned is it's more important to be adaptable and it's more important to understand, you know, how to, how to shuck and jive. And sometimes that means you have to zig when other people are zagging to get where you want to go. But you have to be open to that. And you've got to be willing to, like, question things and look at the big picture of things. And um, just you use your brain and, and do a lot of stuff yourself. Mm. It's, it's hard to ask athletes to do stuff you've never done yourself. So you should try to, like, train hard, do things yourself. Obviously, you can't go out there and knock people out on the field, but you have to be, as a, as a trainer, it's very helpful to actually put yourself in a position and know what it feels like to understand stuff. And it also helps you with not over-prescribing stuff to athletes, too, because a lot of coaches who have never really done it themselves, the volumes of stuff that they'll, they'll create and the workout densities and stuff are huge. And I can look at some of those workouts and go, okay, this guy's never really trained. Right. This, this dude is not going to make it more than halfway through this workout. Right. So he, and so things like that, I think, also really help. And um, like not getting married to any one dogma. So my thing when I, I sometimes, the few times that I am on social media and I see stuff that's going on, I see like there's these camps that are developing where this guy's here, this guy's there, and they're just kind of arguing back and forth around what, and everyone's stuck in their position. And I'm like, there, I see like good in almost all of these guys that are fighting against each other saying this is bad, that's good. And once you get stuck in that one dogma, you're going you're gonna to miss things. And then the other part of the problem is the longer that you stick with a position that you end up being wrong about, 
the harder it is to give it up. And then, then you just, you, you can't learn. So I would say be very careful about that. Be very open-minded and question stuff. Question when, you know, some stuff comes out that might, it sounds like a science and some study did this, but you've seen like the opposite of this, this, and this guy question it. Think about it and go through that stuff. Just be constantly doing that stuff. And I think in a nutshell, that's it. So this is my, this is my very last question. Um, when you were 50, you took some pictures, right? <laughs> you had uh, 12 abs. Um, <laughs> You had uh, four scalps, yeah. you know what I mean, 17 traps, yeah. you know what I mean. Your head looked really little because your neck was really big. So I just want to know, man, are we going to get uh, the new edition for 55, for 60? Uh, when, when are we getting the next in Danny, put, put your own trainer to shame, uh, <laughs> half-naked pictures? <laughs> I don't know, 53 coming up this year, maybe? I don't know. 53. All right, man. Well, listen, man. Uh, it's truly been an honor for me. I think we've been wanting to sit down, and I've been wanting to sit down and do this uh, for a very long time. And, like, this is the right moment for me because it's about teaching people things. It's about allowing them to learn from people who I have learned a lot from, but also give people their flowers who have helped me uh, get to where I am, man. So I always love you, man. Love you to death. Thank you for giving me a little bit of your time. And now you can go eat broccoli and grilled chicken or something like that. No chicken room. But I'm going to eat Mexican food tonight. Uh, I, I appreciate you, brother. Thank my you so much. Love you, my boy. Yes, sir. You too. <laughs>